I'm talking today with this guy who I've never met face to face called Jeffrey Morris. That's me. <laughs> and I've been obsessed with you because well, I'm going to tell you why. You know, there's people you see and they're just full of piss and vinegar. You know, they're all talking big and blah, blah, blah. And they disappear after a six months or a year and, you know, big talk about this and that. Then I just keep seeing you. I thought, what is this guy doing? He's like connected to all these big people. He's doing great work. He's talking a big game, but he seems to be delivering. And it wasn't just for a year or two years. It's been going on for many years. And I start thinking, man, this guy's really on something. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I'm just to introduce myself. I, I'm a film director of, I've been a director since I was 21, uh, full time, nothing else. Mm -hmm. And all I'm interested in is science fiction. And as a boy, I was building spaceships and models and full size spaceships. Mm -hmm. And that's still continued to this day. And everything I do reflects that. So for me to see somebody else in the world who actually maybe is into the same things, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, and I just thought, man, this guy's on, onto something. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. I see you're doing this documentary on the Eagle, which was one of my, you know, my top five favorite spaceships of all time. Can, uh, can we stop you there? Can, I, yeah. I, I got to hear the other four. <laughs> oh, dude. <laughs> okay. I got to um, hear the four. Okay, well, there's the uh, obviously the Millennium Falcon, yeah, mm -hmm. which is a deriv derivative of the Eagle, which it is, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the flying sub, okay, yeah, because that thing's a work of art inside and out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know why the bright yellow just hits me. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, the uh, the, uh, the loss <laughs> you've got it behind you, so I'm kind of embarrassed. But you know, the Jupiter two. Okay. Uh, yeah. That was my very first spaceship love was the Jupiter 2. You know, it's yeah. like, yeah, when I was a kid seeing that in Lost in Space, I thought it was so cool that there was a, uh, uh, to see good guys with a flying saucer, right? It's not, it's not just alien, right? It's, it's the humans with the flying saucer. I think that was really cool. Yeah. And they, and they, and they landed back in the 1950s or 40s, yeah. I think it was on mm -hmm. Earth at one point, which at was. At one point. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. It blew my mind. Uh, yeah. What else? What is? Uh, how many are we up to? Uh, oh, see the, the the space part actually, I think they go together. So I'd call that as one. You know, the, the oh, yeah, I got one of those. Uh, I see that right here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that thing. It's, it's yeah. super. It's another sort of lunar module deliver. You know, um, um, sort of derivative, which is yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. And yeah. the other one is the blockade runner for me. Oh, cool! That's a cool ship. It's but again, <laughs> yeah, eagle, eagle inspired, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so, so I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just think no, it's no, no. I, it's, to hear you, so. I love talking yeah. about things. Yeah. What was your what What are you What are your top favorites? Without my favorites, um, the the Eagle, obviously. Um, I'm a I'm very fond of the refit Enterprise from Star Trek: The Motion Picture. I think that's a that you talk about work of art. I think that ship is a work of art. I think it's a very very beautiful design. Um, I like it a lot. Um, gosh, those are two. The Jupiter Two is a favorite. Um, you know, one that I really like a lot. I mean, I, I start getting into fighters and things. I, lo I love the uh, this uh, Thunder Fighter from uh, Buck Rogers. Mm -hmm. That's a really cool design. Viper. This is a, this is one. Do you remember this this anime um, Gachaman from uh, the, the the Japanese anime that became Battle of the Planets? Battle of the Planets. Yeah, exactly. yeah, Battle of the Planets. I love that design. It's just one that it's just such a cool. You know, so these are smaller ships and everything. I mean, obviously, when when I, looking at Star Wars, I obviously have a, a real love for the Falcon. Um, I actually uh, dig snow speeders a lot. Uh, you know, from from I, I really like the uh, sort of the practicality of the snow speeder and everything. And the uh, you know, it's not really a spaceship, but it's you know, it's, it's a really cool um, Star Wars vehicle. You know, it's very like probably my favorite star wars design in a lot of ways so it's just cool and i i was just looking at this uh this new series this uh, ahsoka and they they have this uh e-wing fighter in there which is just blew my mind i don't know if you saw that or not but that's oh yeah design what a great you know where that came from was the dark empire comic series uh, yes yes uh, heir to the empire yeah no yeah. no dark was it dark empire or heir to the empire was it, I, I think it's an heir to the empire i think the, got know, it 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's what a great design. I love that ship. That's super cool. So yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So I it, mean, it translated kind of well, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, it did. It really did. It really did. It's awesome. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but I've always been into spaceships. It's it's um, uh, my love of spaceships, though. I would have to say it started with the real stuff, right? Um, oh my gosh, I'm not. What am I thinking about? I'm missing 2001. I didn't think about 2001. Um, there's a whole bevy of designs in 2001: A Space Odyssey that I think are fantastic. You know, um, the Discovery and uh, the uh, I mean, I, literally all of them, the, the the space pods from uh, you know the pods from 2001. What an incredible yeah. design! Those look like a little you know amazing little sculptural you know that 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 um oval window in the front and all that you know just what a beautiful design it's just great i mean those that film redefined science fiction in a lot of ways you know so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so at, at 2001 i i have to give kudos to that i think that's probably the most progressive science fiction design of all time in a lot of ways and i think and i think it you know tremendously influenced every single thing that came after that including star wars and obviously space 1999 and all this stuff you didn't have 2001 we wouldn't have all those, you know. I think. No, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, my so my big question is: you're you're working on a uh, a documentary about the eagle, mm -hmm. and you're kind of almost putting aside your movie projects for the moment, uh, which you know is is I, I get it because I understand what you're where you're aiming for. Yeah. Um, yeah. What What was uh, I, I'm guessing? Did you know? We're both maybe too young to have seen. Well, actually, no. I did see Space Nineteen Ninety Nine and UFO originally broadcast. Uh, well, I did too. I was. I okay. was uh, well, you see, I saw UFO. UFO was the very first science fiction show I can remember watching. I saw it with my father, and I must have been about four years old when, mm -hmm. when my father would watch that show. And then uh, the Nineteen Ninety Nine came on in syndication. I think it was about seven. I mean, it was right. like all seventy five. So I was seven years old. So it's yeah. So I still. I saw it first one run and I was a small child, but it, I don't know. I, the seriousness of it and the maturity of it and everything I was in the first episode, I was just in, I thought it was so cool. I was like, okay, I'm growing up and I'm doing that. <laughs> I'm going up there. I'm going to be <laughs> on the, on a moon base flying those ships and doing that. It was just, it felt like a direct connection to me to the NASA stuff that I was seeing at the time. You know, if that makes sense, you know? So yeah. 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 It was clever of them to, uh, you know, kind of rip NASA off in that way, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think it was, um, I think it's, I think it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant, right? I mean, I think that's, I honestly, the part of why I'm exploring this as a documentary is because I really believe it's that connection of those NASA elements that's caused it to endure this long. I really do. Yeah, 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 yeah I really do. Yeah. It was very real world in the, mm -hmm. in the sense that, you know, you could believe they were real. I mean, going back to UFO for a little bit, uh, uh, another one of my obsessions. Um, it's my all-time favorite TV show is UFO. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's so weird, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's such a weird – it's so <laughs> odd. But it's so – but it's it's really good. You know, there's some mm -hmm. really good, dark, um, intense story. You know, I, you know, one I, I like a lot, um, another uh, – uh, British series, The uh, Prisoner, you know, uh, mm -hmm. the, the Prisoner is fantastic. And it, it, it kind of felt almost like a sci-fi prisoner in a way, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, like, well, yeah. the prisoner is kind of sci-fi anyway, but, but this is like a space going sci-fi prisoner in a way, you know, if, if they felt like the, there was DNA that they connected in a way. You know? Yeah. 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 There was a vibe going on. A vibe. That's the term. Yeah. 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 yeah I'm not yeah. saying narratively connected. I'm just mean in terms of the vibe, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. interesting too that you know Star Wars itself and I, I, uh, Star Wars came out of the, the, the basically the same model team mm -hmm. as yep. uh, you know Space ninety ninety nine and I guess UFO. But what about two thousand one? Was that was yeah two thousand? So you've got you've got some continuity, some continuity between two thousand and one, the team there, you know, going forward into. I mean, you you've got Derek Mettings and. Uh, he didn't. Derek didn't work directly into 2001, I don't believe. But he, uh, but some of the members of the team, including Brian Johnson, who worked on 2001, they went. They they were part of that whole, you know, Derek Mettings sort of group that was doing the Jerry Anderson stuff and everything. So hey, you you've seen, of course, you've seen Doppelganger, right? The, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah <laughs> or right? Journey to the Far Side of the Sun. Yeah. Yes, or Journey to the Far Side of the Sun. Yes, yep, yep, yep. So 
that's another one I saw when I was a kid that kind of blew my mind. It was, uh, it was very cool. And that, that's sort of a prototype for UFO in a way. Just says some of the same actors. And well, you had Ed Bishop and uh, George Sewell and, you know, some of those actors. And even even the car that ends up being sort of the prototype for Straker's car is in yeah. is all in, you know, doppelganger. It was pretty cool. So, yeah. 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 1980 yeah. wasn't wasn't exactly the same visage visage though was it you know 1980 was a lot well, well okay here's what i find interesting though is if you if you think about how fast things were advancing in the 50s and 60s if we had not sort of stalled politically and things had kind of i'm not saying we would have been all the way to where it was in in the 1980 depicted in ufo but it didn't i don't think it would have felt crazy to have the idea, the thought of a small moon base being up there in 1980 or these super advanced submarines or all these, right? I mean, it felt like there was a trajectory. And if that trajectory, the, the momentum it kept going that was happening from the 1960s, think about how fast from Kennedy saying, we're going to put a man on the moon by the end of the decade. And they did it, right? Yeah. Well, what was to say if we had, if we kept those sort of quantum leaps continuing, right? They, they, right? It, there's nothing saying that we wouldn't have had something like some of the elements of, of a of a world of, of UFO in 1980. I think I think I can understand how someone might have thought that 1980 would be that cool in a way. Yeah, you know? and yeah. it should have been. Oh, absolutely. Of course, it should have been. It's it's uh, it's I, as I said. It's for me. It's it's um, it's devastating. I'd give up all the smartphones and all the tech and all the stuff we've got right now to have these analog computer. You know, if we had if we had that spacefaring civilization that you saw in in shows like ufo and space 1999 and things like that and we had that kind of those kind of advancements but we had but we were not as advanced as we are in terms of miniature electronics and stuff i'd give it up in a second to have that world you know i think yeah. i think we'd be better off for it i think we'd have a much better world in a lot of ways i really do have you ever seen a show called uh for all mankind at i all? have i have okay. yeah. it kind of follows that trajectory of yes yeah, you know uh -huh. what? What if we had continued? Uh, right. All based yeah. on the fact the Russians got there first, which I right, thought the Russians was... getting there first, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, if you think about it, the, what was the missing link? The real missing link in all this was the fact that uh, um, we didn't have the political motivation anymore. It's like, it's like, uh, as far as the U.S. is concerned, we got to the moon, and I think the public's view was like, I think, I think there was a percentage of the public already that was sort of like, why are we spending so much money on this? And then, and then, you know, and then you had Vietnam happening at the same time and all that, right? So, so I think when once we kind of beat the Russians, it was like, well, what are we doing this for? You know, and I think if there if there had been more of an educational push, I remember being a kid at the time and just not feeling it in school. It was not it was not something that it, it, you know I knew as much as I did about space and and about uh, science because I sought it out myself. It wasn't like it was something that was built into the core of what was in the curriculum, you know? And I think if there'd been more in the curriculum to help kids and help people understand, like not just kids, but everyone, the whole culture, why is this important? And why do we want to keep going? I think we might've kept going, you know, and, and but we didn't. And yeah, yeah and it's, it's, it's a tragedy and I think it's really hurt. I think it's hurt human civilization in a lot of ways. I really do. I, I never would have possibly imagined that 2023 would, would be what it's like. <laughs> You know, I just never would have imagined that in a, in a million years. You know? Well, 2023, we're just starting to go back now. Yes, to just starting. Yeah, it's like if you said, hey, by the way, we're not going to be going back until just starting, as you said, starting to go back. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, we aren't back. <laughs> we're just thinking about it. We're working on it. We're not there yet. You know, so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's it's and the thing that gets me from what I've heard from the scientists is that it's nothing's changed it's still the same technology uh for what nasa's using to go back to the moon it's the same concept meanwhile we got elon musk you know with a a rocket ship that looks like it's from fireball xl5 or something or right yeah that will actually land like it was supposed to you know mm -hmm. um it's kind of interesting we got these two dichotomies going at the moment you know with yeah. space flight which I, yeah. I i i think it's great mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know it's it's uh it's a bit like, do you ever see a show called Salvage One? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yes. <laughs> Which yes, was. As a child, I was, I, that was one that I found very fascinating. It was this guy who had a junkyard who decided yep. to build a rocket ship to go yep. to the moon. And he succeeded. Yes. And yep. then he came back. And the very next episode, 
he decides to go hunt for Bigfoot. <laughs> yes, yes. It's a strange, strange show. Strange <laughs> show. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, that's part of what was so cool about the 70s, though. There was, there was um, you know, maybe they didn't quite get the science right all the time, but there was imagination. It feels like there was more imagination going on. And they, you know, you know like there were um, kind of in that pre-Star Wars zone, there were all kinds of risks being taken and all kinds of crazy stories that they would tell. And I thought it was, it was really cool. You know, Man from Atlantis. And mm. uh, you remember that, right? Oh, and, God, you know, yeah. Obviously, you know, um, Logan's Run. And, uh, you know, all this, it was just a really interesting time. Yeah. I've got I've got a good Logan's Run TV series story. Uh, a friend of mine, Blake Blake Edgerton, who's worked on a lot of my movies, mm-hmm. uh, he rang me up one day and sent me out to uh, somewhere in the in the valley here in Los Angeles mm-hmm. to buy a costume, and it was some of the original costumes from Logan's Run, oh, like wow. like screen news costumes. Oh wow! And so it was a it was a, a Sandman costume, uh, and it was uh, the green robot dude, you know. Uh, I forget his name. He was on the TV series. Okay. So it was a Sandman TV series costume, but we had a look and it had like Michael York's name written in there and kind of faded off. So they'd reuse Michael York's, York's costume for the wow, TV series. For the TV show. Yeah. So he's got the original costumes. Wow. That's, you know, and, well, I have uh, this, it's a, uh, it's 3d printed. Oh man. But, uh, you know, that's, that's my all time favorite sci-fi gun was, uh, the, the, uh, Sandman pistol from, uh, uh, Logan Interesting. Yeah, what yeah. I liked about those is they shot fire out. The they side. shot fire out. It was so cool. And and, and I, I love the idea that there really wasn't. I mean, I, I guess once they got in the TV show, they made a beam come out of it. But in the movie, you just had this flame come out, and then it would affect something in the distance. I thought that was so so cool. It was such an yeah. interesting thing. This sort of energy weapon that was, you know. So I I was I'm a big fan of this design. I think it's really cool. Yeah, very believable. Uh, yeah. Realistic thing. Yeah. You know. Um, <laughs> For yeah. me, if with Locust Run, the only thing let it down was the uh, the space city <laughs> with the Perspex tubes, you know. Oh, sure. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Even it's, as a kid, well, I was like, "What's that?" <laughs> yeah, it. You know, it, it's there's. See, okay, now we, we, you know, we we uh, we t- before we started this uh, chat, we touched on the CG versus. Uh, Versus miniatures, right? That call that I will say Logan's Run probably could have done with some CG <laughs> as far as the the city or map paintings, map yeah. paintings maybe you know like doing doing more map because that miniature as big as it was, it was it screamed miniature, you know, yeah. like super cool miniature, really really cool miniature, but boy you could tell that was a miniature, you know, it was it was yeah. And the same shot turned up in I think uh, Buck Rogers from memory. Hmm. Well, they had, a, they certainly had a similar, um, Buck Rogers, I think it was original content, but they had a similar feel to it. I remember they used like the Bonaventure Hotel in downtown uh, Los Angeles. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you look at Buck Rogers, that was, there's a scene where Buck and Wilma are, are talking. It's right outside the Bonaventure. And then they, they just added like um, some elements that they composited in to make it seem more futuristic. Oh my! They, yeah, 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 yeah. So I, I had, I had a big, um, my, one of my big goals in life from about the age of eleven or twelve was to go and stay at the Bonaventure because of seeing it in Buck Rogers, you know. So yeah. Did you so, Did you stay there? Oh yeah, I, yeah, I've stayed there many times. <laughs> so, wow. Yeah, a little lot of films that have been shot at the Bonaventure actually. Um, I think um, recent in terms of one was uh, they shot uh, Interstellar there. The that was supposed to be the NASA headquarters thing that had the Saturn V, and they shot that in the bottom venture. See, I got to go there now. You see, I yeah. didn't know that. Oh, you should go check it out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah even downstairs in the bottom venture, in, in their um, lower level, they have a sort of a, a display of all the different movies, like posters of all the movies that have been shot. There. Oh my yeah. goodness! Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I got to go there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was worth the, it's worth the trip. Yeah. So. Um, you know, we both uh, we're both sort of going down this path of we've, you know, we we started in the world of models, mm-hmm. and then we, uh, I guess for me, I can only talk about myself. I was working with matte, digital matte paintings in 1996 and 1997. Okay. Um, I, I I believe I did the world's first digital feature film, anamorphically, live action, blah blah blah. But I was able to use. Um, matte paintings back in 96 okay uh through photoshop versions two or three from memory um i you know i think got to the year about the year 2000 Mm -hmm. i started playing with you know 
3D spaceships. Okay. Uh, you know, like in in the computer, which I felt was infinitely way cooler, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. thanks to Babylon Five and all that stuff. Sure. sure. But you know, I, I as I progress through the years, and this is you know this is mostly my perspective. I, I probably had a weird path compared to other people. Uh, so it was more the low end 3D. It wasn't that bad. Mm-hmm. But it was kind of, you know, the smaller budget stuff. And so let's see, what did I do after that? I um, I did a movie called Humanity's End in the year 2006, which is kind of a uh, little bit deriv- derivative of Battlestar Galactica and stuff in the style of the CG, shall we say. Okay, you know, the movie sure. camera and stuff. Uh, yeah, did, you know, one of the, the, the first show that I think really did that well was a program called uh, Space Above and Beyond. In, uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I don't think you would have had the effects in Galactica if you hadn't had Space Above and Beyond. They just, feel, they just felt like they, it, it just directly influenced it in a lot of ways. You know, that sort of handheld camera shooting these um you know the the, the, the chicks had, yeah it was yeah. Fa- fantastic it's fa- it was fantastic that, that was what 95 96 but i really feel like um i'd love to see a like a, a 4k update upgrade of that show boy because that was really well done yeah it was it was a, it was a very definitely that i i didn't even realize that it is definitely a precursor to Galactica yeah, yeah, it, all that. it really is hmm. yeah interesting yeah. Yeah. yeah i think of that being being the one that kind of got into that um, sort of verisimilitude of visual effects, <laughs> you know, where, where, where yeah. hey, space space effects, where it's like it feels immediate and it's now, and like we just dump the camera person right in the middle of the action, and they're trying to capture everything, and you know the camera's shaky and it's moving around, and it's you know that's th- it, it's very um, spontaneous and it has a really great energy to it, and and I think uh, yeah, Galactica got that, and they, they yeah well yeah yeah so yeah. that was for for me that was you know I was. I guess, you know, probably influenced by both of those when I did Humanity's End. Um, I, I, I I took it to the, the extreme in the year 2012 uh, where I uh, I saw other people were doing these green screen movies, you mm-hmm. know, and they look kind of cartoony, but they're okay. And I thought, i got to take it to the next level. Uh, mm-hmm. I did a, a, two movies back-to-back called Starship Rising and Starship Apocalypse, which... Uh, at the time, was shot on the red camera. Uh, mm-hmm. It was shot and finished in 4K in 4K and 5K resolution, which is a little extreme at the time. Because I was going to say that's pretty extreme for uh, 20, yeah. 20. Yeah, that's that's uh, yeah, that's pretty ahead of your time. Yeah. Well, especially when I don't have the budget for it. I did. I mean, I had a budget, but mm-hmm. it, at most uh, high-end TV shows weren't doing it to that level. Um, mm-hmm. But I just. I'd done enough CG that I realized, okay, you know, it's got to be got to be 4K or 5K at least. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so we shot a lot of the stuff on uh, in a studio on green screen. I had very good reasons. So around that time, I, I was having uh, I had a stalker and I had death threats and I had like major death threats going on. So I was a little bit in hiding. So I just felt. You know, going. I had a big crew. Going on location too much, it just starts mm-hmm. to attract a lot of negativity uh, and people, you know, daring to um, uh, to do things against you, shall we say? So I, I kind of became a little bit closeted. I mean, there's a Discovery Channel documentary about it, so it's nothing, you know, really worth talking about for on my sense. But um, I decided I'd do the whole movie or most of the film on green in my own studio. Mm-hmm. So I built a giant spaceship. We shot with the spaceship elements, and then we shot um, on a giant green screen. And it was like, you know, epic in scale and everything else. And it was actually, to be honest, a very secret homage to Blake 7. Okay. Uh, I say that it really wasn't Blake 7 whatsoever, except uh, uh, all the planet names were basically taken with Blake 7. So if okay. you're into Blake 7, you're just like okay. every planet is a Blake okay. 7 From planet. Blake 7. Mm-hmm. It was a like, yeah, but what I did is, um, you know, I went to that extreme. Post production was a nightmare, and we put it out, and it got some good reviews and won a lot of awards for VFX and everything. And then you look back at it many years later, and it's like, oh my god, this thing is so dated. This is such a product of the time. Mm-hmm. It doesn't stand up, you know. Uh, and that was my lesson, I think, 
to the point where I started pulling away from CG a little bit mm -hmm. and I started using physical models again in a couple of the smaller films. Uh, and then I, I, I pretty much doing a big TV series called the time war, which is, you know, big production, a lot of location work. And it's been like five or six years in the making. I went back to doing physical models mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, on a cost per cost basis, I had a lot of learning. I'm not a model builder, I'll be honest with you. Mm -hmm. It was cheaper. It was way cheaper mm -hmm. and it was better. And, I, you know, in the sense that there's something weird about, okay, maybe sometimes you see a few little paintbrush marks and what have you, the same as Space 1999. You can some, you know, on the 4K, you can see the... Well, yeah, the 4K was, was never meant to be... You know, it's funny, you think about when Space 1999 was made, they couldn't have even anticipated any of this higher resolution stuff. And I'm sure in talking to Brian Johnson, we were joking about that, about how it's like, oh my gosh, you can see the wires now, or you can see things, you know, but the, you, know, you think about back then it was broadcast to this super low resolution. Yeah. You know, it, it, it worked. It worked. You know? Yeah. yeah. You yeah. never would have seen it. Never would have seen it. You know, there's no way to see it. Yeah. And that, and that's been my problem because, you know, you got, we got to deliver masters in 4k. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have to shoot 6k or 8k. Mm -hmm. uh, and do all the VFX in 6K and downscale it. Um, but, you know, it, it. I tried a couple of times to do CG, mm -hmm. you know, because it was just easier. Mm -hmm. um, and I even had these, uh, you know, in the time war, I had these big giant walking Martian tripods mm -hmm. that literally walk around, you know, three legs. Mm -hmm. The legs I couldn't animate. It was impossible. I actually tried animating... <laughs> A giant Martian tripod with a, you know, group of puppeteers. It doesn't look good. It mm -hmm. doesn't work. It's it's. I'm sure it's possible, mm -hmm. but I think it's it's really difficult to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what I ended up doing was having these CG legs and a physical head, which I oh, built, sure. and sure. I matted it on top electronically, sure. and it, it looks kind of cool. Yeah. But for me, and I, I'm so I'm going to do the show and tell. Well, actually, I don't know. Can you see behind me? I can't. Okay. So I tell you what the big. This this is a thing called this is a robot from uh, a TV series I, I did, sorry a movie I did called uh, Rogue Warrior Robot Fighter. Mm -hmm. um, it came out through Sony and it was in Walmart and everything and, and did good business at least for Sony. Uh -huh. um, but what we did was, uh, you know, we had this robot character. It's, it's basically a floating robot that speaks in English. Okay. Uh, as it should. Okay. He was. Uh, Tracy Birdsell, the actress who's working opposite him, mm -hmm. instead of her talking to talking to a uh, you know a little uh, tin can, right? She was speaking. She we actually put him on set, mm -hmm. and we shot with him for real and just cut out his his support bracket. Uh, but she got to look him in the eye and, and relate to him in the oh, same yeah. way like you know Mark Hamill did with with Yoda. But it brought the character to life because somehow her acting became more real because she's looking at a physical object. Oh, there's no question that actors, when they have something to interplay with, it, it's just going to be much stronger. I mean, I think for me, um, all you have to do is look at the Star Wars prequels to see that there was, for me, my opinion is watching those, they, there's an emptiness to a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And it's because they were on these massive green screen stages and you have a, you know, you have a, a pole with a, with a tennis ball on it and it's like, okay, react to this, that, okay. Yeah. I'm telling you what that is. That's the director's saying that's, that's blah, 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 blah. Now react to that, you know? Yeah. And you can feel and these are good actors. They're doing the best they can, but it's not the same as actually having something present that they can interplay with. Um, you know, like when, when I did my underwater uh, um, film, uh, Oceanus, one of the things we did with that was, um, you know, we, we obviously weren't, really underwater of course and and i had this the idea was that the submarine had these uh is, is transparent aluminum windows and they can see outside mm -hmm. in, in different situations one of the things i would do was uh i'd work with the actors and i would show them previs really detailed previs on the stage with them at the moment before we would shoot and i would really try to get them to understand how to react to whatever was going on in the previs and that gave them something to interplay with so i could I'm totally understand how when you talk describe tracy being able to interplay with something mm -hmm. physical on the set it just changes the whole dynamic there's something there even if it's not real you can mm -hmm. you can suspend disbelief as the actor because you have something to look into the eyes you know? yeah. yeah yeah 
but so, uh, somehow somehow that that robot came to life mm-hmm. for for people and they said he was, he was our favorite character apart from you mm-hmm. know tracy of course but he just became beloved and that was my lesson uh mm-hmm. you know rogue warrior had a uh a very similar spaceship to the mandalorian exactly the same shape and everything which was a cg ship mm-hmm. uh as good as i could come up with back in in that time period of 2015 2016 of course the mandalorian brought something out it was way better mm-hmm. but it, you know it looks like it's, it's the same ship it's identical mm-hmm. except maybe the coloring's different mm-hmm. um but it was a lesson for me that okay so i just realized that maybe i should have built a physical model at that point mm-hmm. uh and built a physical spaceship mm-hmm. and which has forced me now when i revisit that movie as a tv series i'm going to replace all the cg with the physical spaceship yeah type of things yeah it, it's it's been such a lesson for me mm-hmm. um just in the way you resonate see what everyone so this is the thing i always test market these things mm-hmm. average person will sit down they'll watch a cg movie and you know it, the big vfx and the, the glitter and everything i think oh that's so cool mm-hmm. you know if it's modern they'll say that's cool and in 10 years i say that's horrible mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but they may not always say it's as cool at the time because it's not so glossy and shiny if, if, if it's a physical model. Well, here's the thing. I, I look at some of the stuff. Obviously, you look back at um, some of the Anderson stuff, you know, those those old shows, and you can tell those are miniatures, right? You can uh-huh. tell. That, yeah. But there's still a charm to it. Yeah. There's a there's something for me. I, I'm able to uh, – I don't – how do I describe this? I don't expect it to look real. I expect it to look cool. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Right. So it's like when I watch like UFO or space 1999, and I see those effects, even though they may feel like miniatures, there's still a magic to it that I don't ever get from CG that you, you, like that, you know, that, that's mm-hmm. when I say that it's just full bore CG, especially the stuff nowadays when, um, you know, like, like I watch, let's, let's say for an example, like the, the more, uh, the modern, uh, Star Trek movies, the JJ Abrams, Star Trek films. Mm-hmm. The, the pace of the visual effect shots is really, really, I mean, it's the, the pace is just, to me, it's over the top. It's so fast. Everything's moving so quick, so quickly. Um, it, it starts to, it becomes borderline incoherent in a way, yeah. the, the pacing, right? And and then, yes, they might have the ability to render these spaceships with uh, high resolution and whatever it is, but they they still don't feel real. They don't feel like they have mass. Mm-hmm. They don't feel like they, they they're apl- that, that physics is applying to them. There's all you know. It's so so when you have, they, they, I have people ask me questions sometimes like why do why do these big budget films will have these sweeping shots from these Marvel films and it, they'll go well, why that looks it looks expensive but why do I, why do I not feel anything when I see that why does it yeah. not feel real I'm like well first off you have you you, you you've got a scene that looks like it's flying into a vista that's that's you know 20 miles across or something right. And the camera looks like it, it would have to be moving at like 3000 miles per hour or something. You know, you know, it's like it's like you, you you're flying into a fake vista of CG, CG created vista with a camera that couldn't exist in real space. Yeah. Do you see what I'm saying? So when you put those two things together, we, we do as human beings, we do know what real imagery looks like. We do mm-hmm. know how it, how it works. If you think about um, Jurassic Park yeah. you know, 30 years ago versus some of the more modern Jurassic World movies, I personally believe the visual effects look way better in Jurassic Park. And it's simply because they were they felt more rooted in reality. And they also mm-hmm. relied a lot more on the animatronics. They, yeah. they you know, right? The animatronics rooted it. So then when you cut to something that's CG, your brain's not you're already you you're suspending disbelief. It exactly. Works. Yeah. You're already sold on the matter. You're already sold. The gag has already sold you. So so you can switch the gag on on the audience and they still feel it there's still continuity yeah yeah Yeah. it's very true Mm -hmm. i i mean taking it to another level um with uh the mandalorian for example using the volume Mm -hmm. you know which is a very great piece of technology and you know absolutely love it Mm -hmm. however um you know we, we again i went out and shot on some real locations in scotland and in iceland uh like real locations with rain and bugs and dirt and volcanoes yeah (laughs) volcanoes um and 
there's something weird that happens when you go on location, you know, mm. that you, you suddenly get a, a flurry of bugs coming in literally, or you, you do get a, you know, super, super coldness coming in or wind, You're always the wind. You can't fake the wind to that level sometimes, mm. uh, or the mist or the fog or mm -hmm. the rain where you can see it's real rain going back to the right. mountains. Mm -hmm. um, and that's been, you know, for me, that's been the, uh, the best thing is is taking that great technology you know mm -hmm. the great cameras and the great lenses and sticking it in the rain you know or sticking yeah, it in could the not agree more could not agree yeah. more yeah it, no and I, my, I think yeah. well i think the led volume is a cool bit of technology and we've even used it ourselves and um and it's, it's a technology i'll continue to use in the future on my features and things like that but i, but I don't want to rely on it you know, and I think that there's sometimes some of these shows, there's an over-reliance on it and it starts to develop a look because, you know, there's, there's limitations to what you can do with it. So you have to develop and formulate your shots around the limitations of the technology. Well, if you're doing entire episodes of a TV show and you're using it, it all just starts to feel the same. It starts to look the same. And, it, and, it, and there's a to me that it begins to start to, to lose the realism in a way. Right. Yeah. Whereas if you use it sparingly. And, and in the right places, mm -hmm. it can be an amazing enhancement, but you still have to get out in the field. You still have to shoot on location. You still have to shoot with real set yeah. physical sets and all those things. Otherwise, it just doesn't. I don't know. Yeah. And I, the and I, need honestly, I think it's part. I think audiences. I don't know that the audiences are, are savvy enough always to understand what it is that they're objecting to. Right. I don't know that they can just say, I don't like that because I, they don't understand the technical aspects of it. But it, but I think it it connects to what you're talking about. There's a feeling. Mm. And if that feeling is off, you start to lose interest. And I think yeah. part of what's happening with a lot of this, um, you know, the, the, a lot of the Disney contract, the, 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 you know, the Marvel, the Star Wars, those things, it's like people are starting to kind of grumble about these things because there's so much of it. Mm -hmm. And it all has the same approach and technology and think, right? So then it, all, it just loses what was magical. It loses what was special. You know, one of the reasons why I got into filmmaking was because, um, you know, I, I think about that time period between sort of 77 and say 83, you know, mm -hmm. uh, there was, there was so much, um, it was awe inspiring, literally, yeah. you, you know, you, your jaw would drop when you'd see things. It was, it would, it would, um, you know, and hey, are you a fan at all of the right stuff? The movie, the right stuff. Oh, I love that film. Yeah. I've yeah. seen it probably 50 times. Yeah. It's a phenomenal film and it's, it, but you know, a big part of what makes that film work so well is because of the. The realism of how they did it and even even the work they did with the the miniatures in there it was such a low a lo-fi approach to it you know like these these models on wires and all these you know shot with these camera you know right i mean it yeah was, yeah it just made it feel so much more uh rooted in reality yeah. you know so so when you cross cut those effect shots with the real footage they were getting you you believe it you know, yeah, he really yeah. is in a cockpit being shaken really around. Right. Exactly, exactly. So, it's, you know, you know. whereas if you did that now and then you just all of a sudden cut to, you know, you've got these this set and then and it looks so real and you cut to a CG plane doing something, it, it, there's a, it doesn't have the heart. That's, yeah. that's my point to it. it. It loses heart. Yeah. Yeah. So, so on, on with what you're doing, um, uh, I've noticed you've, you've got the physical models of the eagle. Mm -hmm. And you're also doing some CG. What's, yeah, what's your VFX I mean, what, what approach? We're, what we're going to do, um, it, it, my my goal, Brian Johnson and I were talking a lot about the idea that, you know, they were there were things that they wanted to do back 50 years ago when they did Space 1999 that just technologically wasn't it, it wasn't possible. And um, you know, there there were limitations in what they could fit inside the miniatures, what the miniatures could view operationally. Um, you know, say things like you know, imagine the landing gear going up and down. On the, yeah. on the eagle, right? Or, um, you know, maybe having different types of lights involved in it physically, all those different things that they would have, you know, they, they couldn't do 180 degree shots. Yeah. Uh, right. Those sorts of things. Um, they couldn't, you, you have all these thrusters and things on the spacecraft, but you couldn't show those thrusters fire or have the ship, the ship move as though the thrusters were affecting it. Right. Yeah. Those, those sorts of things. So the idea of saying, let's, let's do a mix of miniatures and 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 use the miniatures where they're you know best involved but then use cg to to fill in the blanks in places where we you know it it, it extends the reach of the effects in a way 
but you use it you use cg as an enhancement not as a as a crutch that's how i look at it got it yeah so so what what's what's going to be are you able to give away the secrets at the moment of how you're going to approach uh showing the eagle in the documentary um you know i'm, I'm still I, right now i'm still in talks with itv a little bit about what how it's all going to work and how it's all going to play out uh what i can tell you is that my my intention is to the the documentary's kind of got five parts to it in a way and it's really a a, a personal journey that follows me kind of i go back and talk about childhood and being influenced by things like 2001 a space odyssey and the space program and then along comes this show called space 1999 i watch this show i see this ship called an eagle i i, I become obsessed with it I, you know uh over the years i meet all these other people from all around the world they're all obsessed with it we collect them people build them there's a gentleman in Denmark who just built a quarter scale one in his in his backyard. It, it, it's yeah. beautifully built, it, you know, wonderful. Um, at some point, someone's going to build a full size one. You know, it, it's just inevitable. And so I'm sitting here going, OK, it's been 50 years. Why do people keep talking about this? What is this about? So my my thought is that the, the general thesis of the film is that the eagle represents um, the future we lost. The future, I think so many young people thought that we're going to grow up to be a part of, to experience and to be to be really a vital portion of. Right. The idea that, hey, I'm going to grow up and I'm going to go up into space or I'm going to be a scientist or I'm going to be a researcher. Or I'm going to be an adventurer. I'm going to be part of that. And the, and and there's a, something was lost. It didn't happen. It just it just didn't happen. And I think, you know, not, nothing against the space shuttle, nothing against the things that happened during that time, but it's nothing compared to the grandiose visions that if you look at NASA art, you know, that was projections or some of the space yeah. art that showed what people saw the coming decades as being, you know, if you're, if you're a little kid and you read that and you see that you think uh, the future looks pretty bright. Yeah. <laughs> the future looks pretty bright. Yeah. And uh, my idea is that we lost that future. And for a lot of us uh, subconsciously, the Eagle became a way that we were holding on to that dream. Mm. That's what I think it is. So we're going to explore that and we're going to talk about I'm going to talk to Brian Johnson about, you know, how the Eagle was how he came up with it and how they actually the visual effects. I'm going to, uh, you know, talk with his, some him and some members of his effects team. I'm going to uh, talk to people who were influenced. Bill George, uh, visual effects supervisor uh, from I ILM. We're going to talk about how Space 1999 and the Eagle affected the, the visual effects industry and even Star Wars, you know, mm -hmm. and everything. So he and I are going to visit with him in San Francisco. I mean, there's a lot of cool things. We're going to go all around the world with this, and we're going to talk to all kinds of people who are either impl influenced by this or impacted by it and that sort of thing. And um, it should be a really, really interesting documentary. I'm even going to talk with some scientists and, and uh, artists who were from back in that time who were projecting the future. Mm -hmm. And I want to find out from them how did it feel. Uh, one of the astronauts who walked on the moon, uh, Charles Duke, is going to be part of this thing. He, uh, wow. Yeah, yeah, which is great. So I'm, I'm going to be actually hanging out with him at the Kennedy Space Center as part of this and talking with him about, uh, I don't know, what was it like to be on the moon and, and what did he think the future was going to be like and where does he see it now and that sort of thing. So at the end of the day, I'm going to have a feature link documentary that's really going to explore. It's not a Space 1999 documentary by any means. It's really about um, this, this unique time in history and how the love of the eagle epitomized that's that time in history's influence on young people. That's what it's about. So <clears throat> I'm hoping to include a lot of original effects of the eagle throughout the documentary mm -hmm. to sort of illustrate different ideas and different thoughts. And and the 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 goal would be for us to do a combination of some miniature work that I do with Brian. Um, mm -hmm. We would we're we're planning to do some work at uh, Pinewood Studios um, in London, and we would do some uh, miniature. Could, could I come? <laughs> we certainly talk about it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I think we could make something work. And uh, wow. yeah, and so, so we're going to do that. But then we're also going to do some uh, some CG work as well that that will enhance that. But but it'll be CG work that Brian and I sort of design and figure out how to intermix with the miniature work we do. Yeah. And so I want I want to kind of show like if, if they would had access to digital technology back then and weren't relying on it, what what could what would they have done with Space 1999? you know, 50 years ago with, with wow. today's tech mixing it. So that's, that's how I see it. You know, it's not, it's not about, Hey, let's just go and recreate the Eagle. Like, I mean, even some of the shots you've seen, I've let you see some of the shots we've already done. 
I tried to hold back and make sure that this felt like something that was more of an homage and that was that was in a much more classical pacing and timing and look and feel as opposed to trying to, you know, like, like I look at <clears throat> some of the new visual effects work they're doing on some of the, the like, like taking the Enterprise and, and the way they fly the Enterprise in the show Strange New Worlds, it looks like a fighter jet. <laughs> the way that, you know it's like you don't feel like that thing is is you know however many meters long and it's got this mass to it and all this stuff it feels like it's flying around like a fly, fighter and it's just you know yeah, I, it, I don't, it defies the laws of physics <laughs> it defies physics it doesn't yeah and, and and it also doesn't feel connected in any way to what we've seen the enterprise look like and do mm. for decades right so to me, I want to. I don't want to sit here and go, "Hey, wouldn't it be cool if we could take the eagle and make it fly like an X-wing or make it fly like a, you know?" I want to. I want to go and say, "Hey, the eagle was awesome the way it was. How can we just take that and make it even more awesome?" <laughs> you know, that's yeah. So, yeah, the approach that I see. So yeah, nice. Yeah. So here's my big question. Uh, you know, I've 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 never done a Kickstarter myself. Uh, mm -hmm. I've, I've been very scared of them. I was once involved in a Kickstarter campaign as a one of the uh, spokespeople. Mm -hmm. And uh, thankfully, that person, you know, did follow through mm -hmm. and finished the uh, finished the campaign and took him longer than expected. He did deliver the uh, the finished goods, but I, I pulled out of it because of um, it wasn't it wasn't the way I would run a run a uh, a, a film production shall we say mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um but thankfully that person did follow through and i mm -hmm. you know i got to give him respect for that because few people we know there's a lot of people who don't follow through with kickstarter um, oh, yeah. Yeah. and uh, you know i i'm obviously i'm not you know putting my name to this but i i get the fear i mean i know you're already on the on the road to 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 doing this um yeah. to people who don't know you what, what's you know uh, and you know we only know each other you know in a small yeah. way but what's the uh what's the guarantee or what what you know oh well, well it's several things i mean number one um we're already in production on this we uh you know i have a i've been um lucky to have uh, a group of uh partners and investors who've worked with me for a number of years to, to really um develop and uh um create my projects and uh you know we're we're really trying to build um uh, my company, Future Dude Entertainment, is really about trying to reinvigorate sci-fi and create this sort of type, this sort of pre-Star Wars sci-fi using today's tech, if that makes sense, right? And telling these deeper stories and, and that sort of thing. Um, and we, they believe in me. And, and I have a group of people who have been following my work over the years who believe in me. Um, so what's happened is I was able to I have a re relationship with a company called Zero Point Zero. They're out of New York. Uh, they did shows like... Um, uh parts unknown with anthony bourdain where he you know the, oh, yeah. the shop yeah. drop, right that's that's one of their they've been nominated for they've won dozens of emmys they've been nominated for i think 96 emmy emmys or something like that um over the years they're, they're the top end of production wow. in this area they're they're our partner on this and partner in the as far as just distributing the project when it's finished and everything like that so it's guaranteed to find a home and it, you know and it's probably going to be in one of the high-end streamers probably like somewhere like an amazon or netflix um, maybe even Apple. Um, and that's something that's for sure. My investors and I have already put together a plan. We've shot, um, we've actually shot two segments of the film already. So we, we shot part of it at Wonderfest, in, uh, uh, which is a big model building convention that happens in uh, Louisville, Kentucky every year. And uh, there's a big, huge display there they did about the Eagle. And so we, we, we interviewed the guys who put that together and people who are model builders of the Eagle and everything was really fun. I went to Calgary um, where there was a big space 1999 convention and that's where I got to meet Nick Tate and got to get to know him and got his involvement in the project. We have, um, we also shot in Colorado with uh, author Kevin J. Anderson, who's uh, he's written tons of Dune, Dune books and star Wars X-Files, those sorts of things. Kevin's a huge space 1999 guy. He and I talked a lot about this lost future and we interviewed him, which was great. And then, um, so we're already in production. It's not like I'm waiting to do the Kickstarter to then do the production. We've already been moving on it. I've been actually working on this project for almost a year. Wow. So I think I, I first thought of it last fall and I was like, you oh, know, man, you know, like, why do people like the Eagle? I should make a movie about that. You know, and it just kind of, kind of exploded from there. So the so, train's rolling. 
the train's rolling. Yeah, this thing is not the, the the Kickstarter is is a way to enable us to be sure we finish it. That's the idea. But we're we're way down. We've got a super um, Anne Marie Gillen, who's a producer. I'm working with seasoned producer. She's been around for decades. Uh, she used to run Morgan Freeman's company, uh, Revelations Entertainment. She uh, uh, legendary producer. She worked on this movie called. Uh, she actually created this film called Fried Green Tomatoes back in the oh, yeah. 90s. That's very yeah. very popular. She, that that was her project. So Anne Marie's been around for a long time and this stuff, and she knows what she's doing. She's my producing partner on the project, and you know, so we've got a great team, and we've been at it for a while. We're super well organized. We we have a plan. I have a, a great machine of people, both in the PR and uh, uh, production realm. So we're going to get it done. It's it's there's no question about it. Where I my target is to have this thing completely finished and in the can by next summer. So that's the thing. So wow, yeah, twenty twenty four. Yes, yes yes and you know we have the the what the uh the 50th anniversary of space 1999 is what 1970 is uh 2025 so i'm hoping that this will make its debut uh, for that which will be fun yeah 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 so, man that's yeah. exciting mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah so wow. yeah so i'm not you know not to uh I, I don't think anyone has anything to worry about whether or not we're going to complete this thing we absolutely are going to complete it and we we also have some some stretch goals that that we're planning um and I'm, once I negotiate everything with ITV, my hope is that we can do some things like even I've got a team at Pinewood who could rebuild the Eagle, the interior of it. You know, oh, everything. my we've already, goodness. Yeah, we've already designed it all. We've already done it virtually. So it's just a matter of just bringing it to life. And these guys worked on Andor, you know, and all kinds of Star Wars movies and, and uh, Marvel TV stuff and movies. And they're, they're good friends of mine. They're working on my film, Persephone. So um, they're they're willing to rebuild the Eagle interior. And so... There's a there's a VR tour we can do of the exterior of the Eagle. There's stuff like that. There's all kinds of stuff we have planned. So I'm uh, I'm just hoping what I can do is sort of finalize my relationship with ITV so that I have the the rights to do this stuff with the Eagle and everything. But as far as documentary is concerned, I don't have to have, you know, I, a documentary is a documentary, right? Yeah. You know, so yeah, it's yeah. Like, yeah. 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 But I'm but I'm hoping that there's something more. I I think I think there's there are millions of fans of this around the world. And there's I mean, in a lot of ways as far as the model building and the interest around the actual physical miniature, there's more now than there's ever been. It's, it's going up, not down. The interest is going up. Yeah. yeah really interesting. So, yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's funny how it's almost uh, eclipsed the show itself. It has no, no question. No question about it. And I, oh, I also should mention that we have uh, Barbara Bain who is the, co-star of the show um, she's going to be in the documentary as well and i actually want to specifically talk to her about uh what it was like to work in those futuristic sets of space 1999 and and you know the costumes the sets the technology and there was even an episode where she uh they they i don't know if you remember the episode it's called the last sunset where they were mm-hmm. the, the moon had the atmosphere and everything and, and then she was she ended up blowing an eagle up in order to get get the attention of you know and everything so i want to talk to her specifically about working in that set and being around all that and everything so it should be fun you know. that was the episode where it rained on the moon for a day yes where it rained yes where it rained and and, and victor goes what was it was it john no i think opens the window just opened the window yeah, that confused that? me because it's like, why would you on a moon base have a window? <laughs> that possibly that? have a window that could do that you know, <laughs> on a moon base. I don't know, but I don't know. It's it's really just in case. Yeah, I guess just in case, just in case we happen to have an atmosphere, you know, and we want to let the air in, we should have those be able to open. Um, that, you know, that show. It's funny because I have, I have a real love of the eagle, and I. It's interesting because. In my journey with this, I've discovered there are a whole bunch of fans in the world who actually like the Eagle more than they like the show. So, I get that. Yeah, I get yeah. that. Yeah, no, I do like the show. I've been rewatching it recently again for the for the fifty millionth time. And yeah, and, uh, yeah. well, there's certainly just, episodes, especially first season, that I think are just fantastic. You know, like Dragon's Domain and War yeah, Games. My and, favorite. Yeah, Dragon's Domain is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and I mean, scared the absolute hell out of me as a child. But, me too. Um, me too. Yeah, yeah. It's like, it's one of those things. It's like, uh, it, it seems like two people, two things people remember about that show is the Eagle and Dragon's Domain. You know, yeah. that, like, you know remember that episode with that monster is like a car wash. <laughs> You know, it's like, yeah, that's what we called it. As I, a I actually ripped that off. Uh, I did a movie called Alien Dawn, which was uh, basically, it was meant to be War of the Worlds. Uh, okay. 
low budget version and uh, they wouldn't let me call it that because they're afraid of lawsuits but there's a scene where uh you've got the martian creature mm -hmm. actually with the tentacles eating somebody up but a lot slower mm -hmm. and uh lots of blood involved and, and everything and i mean it literally was a direct ripoff of that episode <laughs> well, even had the single eye as well you had know? the single eye yeah yeah, yeah. you got it you got to take the machete to the eye you know yeah <laughs> yeah so or the hatchet nice. yeah yeah no um I, I i certainly have a fondness for it and it and it um, uh it was a unique time and it was a unique vision and i don't think we've ever had anything quite like it since and you know i've even pitched itv a couple of times on a, on a reboot of it and everything it's just such a weird um you know you had a show called space 1999 right you know it's mm -hmm. it's a very hard one to to yeah, they kind of stuck themselves there in terms of the idea of anything for you know, right it's like 1999 yeah. what does that mean and you know my my reboots involve some time travel to alternate realities and that sort of thing uh oh, wow yeah and you know they they got pretty close actually the second one especially got very close i have one more potential pitch for how we'd reboot it but they were very clear with me about kind of where they stood that they they're not going to make a space 2099 they're they, you know, they're they're not as concerned. So many writers they had, they say, are coming to them going, let's remake this. But then everyone's focused on here's how the moon could get blasted out of orbit. And they're like, you know, ITV's like, that's not what we're concerned about. We want to know how you're going to treat the characters or what's the story and what's it, you know, and everyone's so stuck in this moon blasted out of orbit thing, you know. And so what I may end up doing is I've been parallel tracking, developing a, a concept for a, a TV miniseries around us set on the moon in the you know a couple decades from now and everything and i think you could do a really cool moon base story that has elements of things like space 1999 but it's an original story yeah because i still think that moon thing is just it's um it's territory that just hasn't been explored enough yet oh exactly yeah yeah we all want to go there yeah we got, only got a couple of minutes left um sure. so just you know in in closing what what do you want to say to well, the world. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, um, you know, several things. I, I hope people will will have a willingness to support us and help us get this thing done. I mean, it's it's not just about the Eagle or Space 1999. It's also, you know, we've we've hit some interesting, I, 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 you know, people like yourself who followed my career and they're and they're like, man, this stuff is really good. Why is it you can't get this over the top or turn it into big movies? Turn, well, and you know how hard it is. It's a very very difficult industry. And I've had some real reticence in terms of the sort of hard sci-fi realistic approach to what I want to do. It's not something that I can easily sell in Hollywood. It's not been an easy sell. And uh, I want to go do this stuff independently. So if, you know, people who are fans of my work who want to see this stuff advance and continue by supporting this project, you're going to help us to kickstart everything. It's not just this documentary. It's all the stuff we're trying to do, you know. Um, and I think that would be a tremendous help to us. And, you know, we're, we're targeting September 13th for our launch date for the Kickstarter, which is breakaway day in the space 1999 lore, you know? No. Yeah. 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 That's, so that's genius. A, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's what we're going to do. And, uh, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll run for 30 days into October. And we really hope that, uh, we can get enough support to get the thing off the ground, get her done. You know, it's uh, I think it's a fantastic project. We have a, an amazing slate of people to be you know, that we're interviewing. They're going to be part of it. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it's going to be a very surprising journey. And I think that even if you're not, you've never heard of Space 1999, don't know anything about this. It's, it's just an interesting look at a, a window into an aspect of our culture that a lot of people just don't know about. And I think it's going to be really fascinating. So that's my that's my spiel. <laughs> Man, I'm excited. I'm yeah. excited. Yeah, well, hey, it's been really wonderful to get to know you more, too, and everything. I've, I've obviously followed your work and everything over the years. And I think um, I've always been impressed with your, like, I'm like, whoa, he's on another volcano. You know, <laughs> you know it's like I, I see you're, you're in social media and the kind of things and places you go. You, you're a renegade. You take, you take risks. You get out there. You, you do things. You get them done. And I think it's really impressive. And so I, I, I think we're kindred spirits, and I really appreciate you having an interest in what I'm trying to do. And you know, and oh, absolutely, it's out there. I, I just realized one day I said, "This guy's a true brother." You know, this is this is the guy. This is the guy I should have grown up with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, feelings mutual. So very appreciated. Hi there. This is Nick Tate. 
I'm super excited to be part of the new documentary, The Eagle Has Landed. An exclusive look starts now. 50 years ago, an icon was born. The Eagle Transporter is one of the greatest sci-fi spacecraft ever conceived. To this day, the design provokes an intense devotion among countless fans around the world. The question is, why? I'm writer-director Jeffrey Morris. I've been enamored with the Eagle since I first saw it in the TV series Space 1999 back in 1975. As a child who followed the Apollo program, the Eagle felt like a direct descendant of NASA's lunar module. Those transformative moon missions left an indelible impact on a generation, as did the Eagle in Space 1999. Over the years, I've discovered that I'm just one of millions of fans who has an affection for the Eagle and a nostalgia for a future we never achieved. So I'm shooting a feature documentary about the origins of this beloved ship while also exploring its ongoing cultural impact. And I'm inviting you to join me. I'll be speaking with the Eagles designer, visual effects wizard Brian Johnson. I'll also chat with Nick Tate, the actor who played legendary pilot Captain Alan Carter. It's going to be an epic journey as I travel around the globe to speak with Eagle aficionados and luminaries from the worlds of science and science fiction. As for myself, the visionary world building in Space 1999 blew my mind. It ultimately inspired me to become a filmmaker and production designer. I'm the creator of hard sci-fi projects such as the forthcoming deep space adventure Persephone, the apocalyptic underwater thriller Oceanus, and the universe hopping techno fantasy Parallel Man. Now I'm bringing all of my experience and passion to the creation of this documentary. The good news is we've already begun production. We self-financed a shoot in Louisville, Kentucky at Wonderfest, where I spoke with lifelong Eagle fans from around the country. They shared passionate stories about the iconic vessel and the aspects that make it so memorable. Then I traveled to Colorado, where I interviewed Kevin J. Anderson, the best-selling author of books set in the Dune, Star Wars, and X-Files universes. He also happens to be a huge fan of Space 1999. Recently, Kevin and I co-authored the novelization of my film, Persephone. We had a blast discussing our mutual love of the Eagle and what it represents. Yet, there's still plenty left to do. I have to hire production crews at locations around the world. I also need to create visual effects and music. And of course, it all has to be edited together at a level that will rival any award-winning documentary. Now I'm asking for your assistance in completing the voyage. Check out our Kickstarter. There are tons of great rewards and even a couple of awesome stretch goals. A future began 50 years ago, and its time is now. Become a supporter of The Eagle Has Landed.